Russian airstrikes have hit two children's hospitals in Ukraine. Officials say three people died, including a child, when a series of blasts hit a maternity hospital in the besieged city of Mariupol. Russia denies the reports as fake news and says Ukrainian troops had taken over the building. But Western allies say the Russian military is using weapons indiscriminately in what Ukraine is calling a genocide. A warning, this report contains some disturbing images. The smouldering ruins, not of a military installation, but a maternity hospital in Mariupol. The direct hit from an apparent Russian airstrike sent women in labour fleeing into the cold. Hundreds are reported injured. Mariupol has been the target of sustained bombing and shelling for days. Mass graves have been dug for the dead. Authorities have told people how to dispose of dead family members. Wrap the bodies, tie the limbs and leave them on the street. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling Russia's attacks on civilians a genocide. Today, we must be united in condemning this war crime of Russia, which reflects all the evil that the occupiers have brought to our land, all of the destroyed cities and everything they've done. The bombing of a maternity hospital is conclusive evidence that what is happening is a genocide of Ukrainians. In Zotomir, Russian bombs hit two more hospitals. One of them, another children's hospital. The city is nearly 150 kilometers west of Kiev and has come under increasing fire. Just the night before, another civilian target was hit. Come and see this. This man won't need a no-fly zone anymore, but we do. He won't need any fighter planes anymore, but we do. We do. Diplomatic negotiations are stepping up. But as Russia perseveres with heavy shelling, Ukrainian civilians are paying a high price for Vladimir Putin's bloody war. Well, earlier I spoke to DW correspondent Nick Connolly in Kyiv and asked him how the news of the airstrikes on those two children's hospitals has been received in the Ukrainian capital. Most people I've spoken to don't really have anything, can't, don't find any words because it is just so shocking. I think it is you know, clear to people now that this is all out war. This is not, definitely not the special operation that Vladimir Putin is trying to call it. This is a, a war of the kind that Europe really hasn't seen probably since the Second World War. And people are expecting this to get a lot bloodier and a lot more dangerous for civilians in the days to come. We've had those failed attempts at civilian corridors to get people out of Mariupol. Those have failed several times. The Ukrainians say that the Russians are just not sticking to their side of the bargain, are not keeping two temporary ceasefires to allow civilians out of that city that has been under siege now for days and is without power, without mobile phone networks, and increasingly low on food. Um, I think the main message that people, Ukrainians are taking out of this is that you know, they are going to keep on demanding the West closes the skies above Ukraine, creates a no-fly zone, because they say this is a situation where this is not war as, according to the rules, this is a war that is going to cause huge civilian casualties, and basically this is at Europe's conscience. If Europe, if the West, if the US allows Russia to keep its dominance in the skies, we're going to see more hospitals, more children dying at home in their schools in hospitals and this is going to be uh, something that we're going to see again and again. So there's more push from Zelensky, from other Ukrainian figures. We've seen Ukrainians gathering petitions, thousands of people signing them. They're going to send those west in the hope that maybe the west will think again and will risk more direct confrontation with Russia and create that kind of no-fly zone that could allow Ukraine a better chance of winning this war because on the ground in kind of hand ground fighting between units on the ground. The Ukrainians are doing pretty well. The Russians are having big logistical issues. So the Ukrainian feeling is if they have that safety from above and if the Russians are not allowed to bomb cities but also Ukrainian military, then they have a much better chance of keeping their country. 
That was DW correspondent Nick Connolly in Kyiv. Well, despite frequent shelling of populated areas by Russia, US military officials say there's been little change on the ground over the past 24 hours. But one area where Russian troops may be making progress is in the city of Mykolaiv, which has seen heavy fighting. Mykolaiv is key to Russia's bid to seize control of Ukraine's Black Sea coast. The city of almost half a million is located near the city of Odessa, which is Ukraine's main port. Mykolaiv has come under heavy bombardment from Russian artillery. Well, joining me from Mykolaiv in Ukraine is the regional governor, Vitaly Kim. Thank you for speaking to us at this very difficult time. Let me begin by asking if the city of Mykolaiv is still under Ukrainian control. Yeah, the city of Mykolaiv is still under our control. And uh, also we um, moved forward to the Kherson and Sigirovka. And in terms of the basics, uh, food, water, heating, what are conditions like for people in the city right now? Um, about food, medicine and water, it's OK in the city, in the big cities, in our region, in our small, uh, in small cities, not small cities, it's small villages, so there, is, there are some problems, but we are uh, making our logistics to provide them all they need. There is no catastrophe, but we need uh, some storage because we have only one way to, of supply for now, one road for supply for, for now. And do you have a sense, do you have accurate updates? Where exactly are the Russian forces right now in relation to your city? Yes, I have uh, all that data about this, but I won't, uh, won't tell you about it because they are moving. And uh, this is secret information, I won't give you it. Understood. How likely is it that Russian forces will end up occupying the city as they have in Kherson? Do you still have hope that they can be stopped at this point? There is... Uh... If you will be in Nikolaev, you will uh, see by your own eyes that we are not going to leave our city in any way. And I think that we are going to attack and to uh, um, renew our territory. The enemy is very exhausted. Uh, he, it ha he has no motivation. He has no fuel. We need more uh, power and more vehicles for, uh, for attack. That's all. I think that this is the turning point of uh, this war. I don't believe they can move forward fastly anymore. After two weeks of being under the stress of invasion, what about the mentality of your people? How are they holding up? Our, our mentality is now for 100% uh, Ukrainian. Any small village resists the occupant. Uh, we don't uh, communicate with Russian. We do not uh, make any deals with them. We don't like them. We want them to go home. And, to, and this is uh, the common, common idea of our region and of our country. Aside from those who choose to, to stay and fight, in terms of communication with the Russians, part of that is organising uh, safe passage out of the city for civilians. Are efforts underway? Do they continue? Are you getting civilians out who need to get out of that city? Yes, we have three ways, uh, three way, three roads uh, that civilians can move out from our, our city or region. And uh, first of all, it's uh, women and children. Uh, for now, many, many of uh, strong men, they are moving to the city to help us to, for the fighting. So we have, uh, we are growing with our, our uh, war power and we are waiting and looking forward for attack. Vitaly Kim, Governor of Ukraine's Mykolaiv region, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. OK, time to take a look now at some of the other developments in the conflict. And Washington is warning of a potential chemical or biological weapons attack by Russia in Ukraine. It comes after Moscow accused the US of supporting a bioweapons program in Ukraine. The Biden administration believes the accusation could be an attempt by the Kremlin to justify such an attack.
The US House of Representatives has approved a massive spending bill that includes $13.6 billion of aid to Ukraine and European allies. The funds will cover the cost of sending US troops and weapons to Eastern Europe, as well as care for refugees. US Vice President Kamala Harris is in Warsaw for talks with Polish leaders. Tensions are high after the United States rejected a proposal from Poland to transfer MiG-29 fighter jets to a US airbase and then deliver them on to Ukraine. After concluding her visit to Poland, Harris will then head to Romania. Well, the United Nations says around 2.2 million people have now fled Ukraine. Most of them are women and children, often leaving loved ones behind to fight, not knowing whether they'll see each other again. The majority of the refugees are arriving in Poland. DW's Alexandra von Naaman sent us this report from the western border crossing of Sinje. One last embrace before they say goodbye. Vadim has brought his family to the Polish border so they can leave the country. He will be heading back to the front lines. It is because of the kids. No one wants to leave their home. It's so hard. You can't explain it. It's hard. We don't know whether we're going to see each other again. It was so good to have them by my side. When you're together with your family, you feel better. Now I'll be alone, but I know they'll be safe. And its safety is just a few meters away. We are at the border checkpoint in Shehini, the busiest border crossing between Ukraine and Poland. Those who are now here have been waiting for hours, just like Natalia and her twins. They escaped the Russian bombardments in Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine. We've been through a lot. You're sitting in the hall or in the cellar with your children while they're bombing the city. And you don't know, will a bomb drop now and that's it? What did we do to deserve that? Natalia doesn't believe that the war will be over soon. Many Ukrainians seem to think the same. And so the lines at the border are not getting any shorter. People on the move, both inside and outside the country, in desperate need of protection and support. As Russia's war with Ukraine continues, an estimated 4 million people may flee the country, according to the United Nations. Hot tea and snacks for free distributed by Ukrainian and international volunteers along the road to the border. This is where we meet Natella from Kiev. She's traveling alone with her three children. The children are suffering the most because my husband had to stay in Kyiv. They cry. My oldest son keeps asking, will we never ever see dad again? Then he starts crying again. The UN has called it the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. This is what it looks like in real life. The foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine are in Turkey for their first face-to-face -face talk since the invasion of Ukraine. Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Çavuşoğlu greeted his Ukrainian counterpart Dmitry Kuleba and Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov on the sidelines of a diplomacy forum in Antalya. Çavuşoğlu says the aim is to pave the way for a meeting between the leaders of Russia and Ukraine. Host Turkey is a NATO member but has close ties to both countries. Well, let's get more on this from DW's political analyst for Eastern Europe and Russia, Konstantin Eget. Welcome to you, Konstantin. What can be expected from the meeting today? Hello, Anthony. The decision essentially lies with Putin. If he's bent on continuing his uh, invasion of Ukraine, his campaign in Ukraine, then basically it will be very simple. Lavrov recites the old demands, uh, basically demilitarization, recognition of the so-called Donbass republics, recognition of the Crimean annexation, no NATO in Ukraine. Uh, Kuleba says, no, everyone leaves. I think that if Lavrov is to offer some modified uh, demands, then it may be the beginning of a kind of conversation. After two weeks of war and indeed eight years of conflict between the two, what can be achieved at this political level against that backdrop? Little. It's only opening the doors for, for a conversation, if any. 
But I think the important thing is that uh, Mevlut Çavuşoglu, the Turkish uh, foreign minister, is uh, mediating. Uh, frankly, Turkey and actually specifically Turkish President Recep Erdogan, uh, they belong to kind of very few entities in the world that Putin respects. Uh, Putin respects Erdogan for shooting down two Russian planes, for generally treating Russia as no better than others, and because of that. Uh, I think the Turks know that they maybe can achieve something with Moscow. And that gives me a glimmer of hope that this door will not be shut. But it's a very small glimmer, frankly speaking. Yeah, the glimmer of hope it, it relates to compromises. What compromises could the respective sides make, starting with the Ukrainian side first? Well, it can only be my kind of uh, conjecture for now, and as, as, as well as yours and anyone else's. But I think that one has to proceed from the perception that actually Ukraine is gradually winning this war. And they will not go back to any kind of things they could discuss, let's say, prior to 24th of November when Putin launched the invasion. I'd say the big bargain, theoretically, in my view, at least for now, uh, will be basically in non-NATO, although not neutral status of Ukraine, but non, no membership of NATO in exchange for complete return of territories, including the Crimea. I think that is probably the minimum to which President Zelensky will agree. question is whether the Russians will agree to that. And that is a very, very big if. Yeah. And then the next big and natural question, what uh, compromises could possibly the Russians make here, if any? Well, frankly speaking, the way things go now militarily, uh, Putin has either to go really nuclear in a literal sense of the word, or start wrapping up this war, uh, or at least freezing it. Uh, I think that in current circumstances, Putin will not agree to give back the Crimea. I think he, that, that he thinks it's his kind of lifetime achievement. If you wish. But Russian elite probably will be happy to give anything away uh, in order to lift sanctions. Uh, and I think that um, where the Russians have some kind of leverage, where the Kremlin has some leverage, is in the fact that Zelensky is a democratically elected president who cares for his people, who cares for them being killed, maimed, and uh, basically exiled, becoming refugees. And this is a sensitive topic which I think uh, Russia will explore and, and will try and force Zelensky to uh, do things they want, threatening more violence against innocent Ukrainians. And here, of course, a lot of things uh, depend on the West and on the, uh, on the public support that Zelensky may get or can get from the Ukrainian uh, people. As of now, it seems to be very, very strong, and he's really a kind of war chief. And this gives him very, very strong cards to play. It only seems that he is weakened by this invasion. I think he's been strengthened by that. A fascinating day coming up in Turkey. Thank you. DW political analyst Konstantin Eget. Many thanks. Thank you.